Friday on CityCast Madison. It's Thursday, so of course we're dishing on Madison's food scene. The idea of seeing food as medicine is older than the written word. Using plants to prevent illness and disease is time tested, but many of us blessed with modern conveniences have become pretty disconnected from these ancient practices. Madison Public Libraries got a new naturalist in residence this September, Quantis Winters, and she's committed to reconnecting us to our roots, including through our diet. We sat down with her to hear about the new role and her upcoming food workshops. It's Thursday, September 14th. I'm Bianca Martin, and here's what Madison's talking about. Hi, Quantis. Hello. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing really good. How are you? I'm doing really good. So public TV fans know you as the co-host of Let's Grow Stuff on PBS. Yes. But you're also the Madison Public Library's naturalist in residence this month. Yeah. What does that job entail? So basically, the library and I, as well as Madison Parks, we partner together to create 12 events that are free to the community for the month of September. And the activities, the whole purpose basically is, or my purpose for the residency and my events is to help folks to connect with nature. And I do that through a lot of different ways. A lot of the ways are methods that I have used to connect to nature myself earlier in my journey and even now. Um, so that looks like um, having some herbal infusion workshops. I so far have taught people how to make their own apple cider vinegar hair rinses. Um, I've taken folks on some meditative nature walks where we incorporate writing, um, nature writing, and we have made um, collective poems together. Um, and then some nature times uh, for the kiddos, which looks like reading a book that's based on nature, whether it be gardening or just like the love of nature. Um, and then we do art activities together. And there are a few other things too, but yeah. Yes. It's so exciting. And I so want to know how to do this apple cider vinegar rinse. <laughs> hair rinse. Yeah, I, it, it's been pretty like vital in my, my hair care journey, especially when I had locks. It was like, yeah, make sure you're nice and soft. Oh, you're doing a, a series of events and you've got a workshop coming up about digestive bitters. Yes. That's at the Meadow Ridge Library this Friday. Yep. And that's going to be at two o'clock and it ends at three. And people who come to the workshop will get to leave with their own digestive bitters. So like you're going to learn as you're making it. It's because, you know, there are some workshops where you come in and you're like taught how to make something, but you don't actually get to make it yourself or leave with the finished product. Um, so I'm going to be walking through people um, in like this hands on workshop. I love it for some folks or maybe, you know, many folks we might need to start the basics. Like what are bitters? Yes. So digestive bitters are like a concoction <laughs> of, you know, bitter ingredients. And the reason why they're so good is because they help with your digestive system, um, as the name suggests. So they help with things like bloating. If you have irritable bowel syndrome, that they're really good for that. I have taken them a lot. You can eat them like before you or drink them before you eat your meal or you can do take them after. Um, but basically like you want to do it whenever you're about to start digesting food because it just like helps your gut do what it needs to do in order to not feel upset or like, you know, have any failures <laughs> and, and, and uh, the churn and burn <laughs> yeah. <and> turn. <laughs> you just want the smooth process exactly so so yeah i'm going to show folks how to make that and we're actually going to use some ingredients that a lot of people might be familiar with so we're going to use dandelion root and burdock root Ooh. um a lot of people know these things as weeds but i'm like i truly believe in that like weeds are not like bad 
Um, weeds are also medicine. Weeds are also food. It just is like however you think about them, I think is what kind of shapes how you decide to use them. Um, but I'm a fan of weeds. And so I have incorporated these two common weeds into the digestive bitters because a lot of people don't know that they're actually really medicinal and both are really great for your digestive system and just like to help with that bloating and upset stomach issues and things like that. Um, and then the base of it will be apple cider vinegar, which is also another thing that's really great for your stomach. I am just learning about the power of weeds. We just talked to Alex Booker of Booker Botanicals. Oh, I love Alex. Yeah. And he was talking about weeds, putting them in a CSA. And I was like, okay, clearly people are sleeping on weeds. So this is the second time. So this is exciting. Dandelions, beautiful. So what got you interested in making bitters? Very great question. Um, So when I first like started on my journey of connecting with nature, herbalism was kind of like my gateway into everything else because it was easy to just go to the library, check out some books on herbalism and how to use different plants. And um, digestive bitters are a very easy way to like get into herbalism because it's literally just like research the plant that you're using infuse it in the apple cider vinegar. So it's like really simple. But the reason why I chose them besides just the ease of it and the accessibility was because I myself deal with a lot of stomach issues. Like I get bloated really easily if I eat certain foods, pretty sure I have irritable bowel syndrome. So I was trying to find something that would help me to basically feel better after I eat my meals. Um, And I've incorporated other things, but the bitters have been like really helpful for that. Um, And I just find that it just like when I'm done eating, I don't feel, you know, so crappy like I was feeling before. And yeah, it just makes my stomach feel a lot better. Um, And so that's why I got into it. I was just trying to like practice what it would be like to make my own medicines and digestive bitters were like, right there calling my name and we're like to me and I was like okay (laughs) and now that you've explained it they're calling my name and I feel like you know us Wisconsinites it's about to be fall it's about to get cheesy exactly (laughs) or it stays cheesy (laughs) but I'm like this is okay this is uh, this is essential listening right now digestive bitters and it sounds like so you you get herbs that you'd research you find the herbs and you you said and you put them in the apple cider vinegar that's the process of making bitters Exactly. So basically you get your herbs, you put them into your jar, fill the jar up all the way to the top with the apple cider vinegar, making sure that all the herbs are covered. And then you leave it to infuse for like two to four weeks, depending. When you have roots, I like to infuse them a little bit longer just because they're like, they're way more sturdy and harder to penetrate than say like peppermint leaf but yeah so that it's literally that simple you literally just put everything in a jar and then let leave it alone and let it infuse like the most you have to do while it's infusing um for that amount of time is just like shake the jar like every day for a little bit and then put it back you know in a nice uh cool spot but yeah, it's really easy. The same I love thing it. with the hair rinse. It's actually a very similar process. Um, it's just that you would use herbs that have benefits for your hair versus your stomach. Like? Like lavender. Uh, <laughs> lavender is really good for like, if you feel like your hair is really oily, lavender is really good for that. And it, it also has the benefits of, you know, the aromatherapy benefits of it too. So it smells really good. Um, peppermint is actually something that could pass for a digestive bitter and a hair rinse. So it's actually kind of funny now that I think about it, because you can use a lot of the like apple cider vinegar is both ways. If you're going to use it for a digestive bitter, I just like to take that as a shot. I'll do like three tablespoons or so, and then just like throw it back. Throw it back, throw it back. Yeah. If you don't want to throw it back, because apple cider vinegar is very strong, you could also like put it in a cup of tea or put it in a glass of water. Like, yes. Well, speaking of teas, you're also leading a workshop on blending your own herbal teas. So what are some of your favorite herbs to include in those? 
Wonderful question. I love, 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 love um, lemon balm. That's one of my favorites. It's very like calming and soothing. Most of the uh, herbs that I have in my apothecary are like calming and soothing, soothing type of herbs just to like, you know, I have a busy schedule. I'm a doula and that can like, it can be very like ugh, high strung sometimes. Chamomile is really great. Um, I also like to like have different dried fruits. Um, and I get a lot of these things from Mountain Rose Herbs, which is a website or um, the community pharmacy, which is in Madison. Mountain? Mountain Rose Herbs. Like rose, like the flower? Uh-huh. Yep. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, but yeah, so I like to also infuse like different types of fruits, whether it be like the actual like meat of the fruit or the peel of the fruit. So I, it just adds like a different flavor to it for me sometimes. So orange peels are really good. You can get those dried from different places, dried fruits, like dried mango, dried a- apricot, just, they just add like a wonderful touch to different, um, you know, teas that I'm blending up and making. So do you like cut up the like the like you just get dried mango at the store, which I just did the other day, exactly. you just like cut into little pieces and you pop it in. Oh, my God. Yep, exactly. <laughs> I'll do it. Uh huh. Um, ginger root is also a really nice one to add to. Great for your stomach. You could totally make that into a di- digestive bitter as well, but it's great for a tea. I will add it to a blend just a little bit of it because it's really strong and yeah, it has a great flavor. But those are like some of the things that I'm I'm going to be teaching in the workshop coming up just to show people like, you know, how to balance out different herbs so that you know how much of what to use so that you're not like putting a whole bunch of like this really spicy item like ginger root and it's overpowering like everything else that you have in your blend. Um, so I'll be like teaching things like that. Everyone will get to leave with their own jar of whatever tea blend they decide to make. Um, and there'll be like multiple herbs for them to choose from. So yeah, it'll be kind of like a buffet. What makes a good blend? What makes a good blend in my opinion is first knowing like, what exactly you're looking for um, or like what is the purpose of the tea that you, you like you want. So for me, I whenever I make a tea blend, it always has like a particular purpose, whether that's like, oh, I just I want to be more restful. So I'm going to figure out a tea blend that I can make that's more restful. And then I'll do some research and then I'll see something that's like, oh, valerian root is really great for getting sleep. And oat straw is really great for getting sleep. And so I'm like, okay, gonna put those two together. And then I also like to put a component in it that's gonna give me like a nice flavor because sometimes you can use herbs that are like, a little kapui, you know, not a little, a little yeah. nisty, nisty. <laughs> They're like not really good. Um, so I like to. How about skip? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I like to marry like medicinal and also flavor together. So valerian root is one of those things that are like it has a very strong flavor. Uh, if you Google it, some people will say that it smells like dirty socks. It doesn't have a pleasant smell. It doesn't. <laughs> but. If you blend it with something that's more pleasant and soft, like chamomile, um, or if you add some peppermint in there just to like mask that the strong flavor of the valerian root, then it's going to be more palatable and you can drink it. So I would say like when you're making your own tea, bl- tea blends, think about the medicinal part of it, which can be like your base aspect, and then figure out complementary herbs that you can add that have that flavor component that you're looking for. And then don't be afraid to add some dry fruit, too. Oh, my gosh. This workshop sounds absolutely beautiful. And you just gave us so many goods. <laughs> <laughs> what are you growing right now? So right now, I'm mainly growing in the Let's Grow Stuff garden. The Let's Grow Stuff garden has a bunch of different things from green beans to broccoli, uh, different types of flowers like cosmos and zinnias and sunflowers. There are onions, red and um, yellow. There are squash. And then I have my own personal garden. And in my personal garden, I have shishito peppers, which are uh, like on the, they're, they're wrapping up. So they're about done. Um, and then I have some spearmint and kale and lavender. I keep that one a lot more simple. I'm just in magic land hearing all of this. <laughs> 
<laughs> wow, vegetables. <laughs> the vegetables, the flowers, the colors, the senses. Obviously, because I feel the joy. What do you find most rewarding about growing your own food? Ooh, I think what I feel, what I find most rewarding is probably being able to cook with the things that I grow and being able to give like the things that I grow to other people. Like I, that's when I feel the most sense of pride. Like I feel very like happy and prideful when I go to my garden and get some kale and make a salad. I'm like, oh my goodness, like this is kale that I grew. Like I was here when it was just a little baby and now it's in my bowl. (laughs) Or when I get to like share with my friends, like I just think that that's so amazing. And I think that's like what gives me the most excitement when it comes to growing besides like showing other people how to do it too. I mean, I'm hearing so much from you that a lot of what I'm hearing from you is like thinking of food as medicine too and this connecting force and the fact that you're excited to see it grow from its birth and get bigger. I want to ask you, you're known as a food doula. I've never heard that expression, those two things put together, but when we're talking about food as medicine, it seems really genius. Can you talk about that? (laughs) So that name was given to me by one of my like doula mentors, uh, Mikaela. And she gave me that name or suggested that I like start going by that name because I started to incorporate food into my doula practice by feeding, you know, the moms and the families that I was working with, um, because I knew that the things that I was giving them had, you know, nutrients that were really good for specific parts of their healing, specifically in postpartum. Um, So it started with me just like making a pot of collard greens for um, moms that I served. And that kind of came from the fact that my own mother, like basically brought me back to health by cooking me collard greens. And it wasn't until I did some research years later that I found out that um, greens are really rich in iron and they're really rich in vitamin K. And once I found this out, I was like, oh my goodness, I need to start giving this to moms in postpartum because, you know, you are, your body is healing. You, you know, lose blood when you give birth, things like that. So having that vitamin K and that iron really just helps to build up your blood. It helps with like your wounds healing and things like that. Um, So it's like, it's very medicinal and you can take, you know, supplements as well. I definitely, you know, I take supplements myself, but having like that extra support of food and trying to make that the primary source of the nutrients that you eat, I feel like it really makes a world of difference in just your healing journey. And even just like while you're pregnant, just to have like that food support. Um, We know that like when we eat foods that are like heavily processed um, or not like really nutrient dense, like you can feel it um, versus when you eat foods that, and I like have a very balanced diet. So I love hot Cheetos just as much as I love okra. (laughs) So it's like, that's right. (laughs) So I can feel, I feel the difference when I'm like, okay, I need some carrots. (laughs) I feel like a hot Cheeto right right now. (laughs) (laughs) so so yeah that's why I'm like such a champion of that and and it's also because like food on just like a spiritual level is very comforting like there are meals that you can have that may remind you of certain memories you know whether pleasant or not so pleasant they may remind you of certain moments in your life or make you feel a certain way like the food just in can invoke emotions um and so yeah I just I think that cooking is just another part of nurturing the people that I love. Yes, it's love. Food is love. If I were to get another tattoo, I only have one. It'd be food is love. And and what I'm hearing too is you're actually bringing your veg- veggies and produce to mothers. Another part of your work is helping folks reconnect with nature and so that they can grow their own stuff. And there are a lot of barriers to that. You're, it's part of your naturalist in residence, you know, as before we leave, like, what are you hoping folks take away from some of the things that you're offering at that residence? What I'm hoping is that the residency acts as a seed almost for the folks who are able to attend, who 
may not feel because of a multitude of reasons, like they don't really have a place within the outdoors or like having a relationship with nature isn't culturally relevant for them. I want this residency to be the seed that just like grows into this beautiful connection with the land and their understanding that we actually all do have a place, um, regardless of what your race is, regardless of what your ability is, regardless of what your sexuality is, like you have a space and you get to curate what that looks like. Um, so, and that's why I've like been trying to do things that are more hands-on, trying to do things that kind of pull people's emotions and thoughts out of them, like with the nature writing, things like that, um, to show that it doesn't just have to look one way. A question that I've been asked a few times while in the residency is, what is a naturalist to you? A lot of us know of naturalists as like these people, they are degreed in academia. They know all the Latin names for all the plants. They can point out every single bird and bug that, you know, is flying through the air. Um, but I'm the type of naturalist where it's based off of what is it to bond with the land? What does it look like to go to nature and get the medicine that you need? What does it look like, you know, to look up at the sky and maybe you can't name all the stars, but you feel more beautiful because you know that you're cut from the same cloth, you know? Um, that's the kind of naturalist I am where it's about um, just forming that relationship. And I would hope that people get that from the residency that like you can do something as simple as take a walk pick some flowers, smell them, enjoy them, make an infusion. Um, and you too can be a naturalist because naturalist is, being a naturalist is about loving the land and having that relationship. Quantis, you out here, you got me basically crying. I've got goosebumps, <laughs> my hair is standing up. I'm like so touched. Thank you so much for joining us um, and giving us your magic. This is just wonderful. Thank you. That's Quantis Winters. She is Madison Public Library's new naturalist in residence for September and co-host of Let's Grow Stuff on PBS. She's also a doula, writer, agriculturalist, and artist. If you want to dig more into what Quantis has on deck for her residency, including that Bitters event tomorrow, check out our show notes for a link. <laughs> And here's what else Madison's talking about. A new brewery in town. The Manaqua Brewing Company is coming to Madison. They're opening a tap room next to Trixie's Liquor on Eastwash. Owner Kirk Bankstad has fought with local officials in Oneida County who've been trying to force his Manaqua tap room to close. Bankstad's run for office as an outspoken progressive and has been at odds politically with many in the Northwoods. He expects to open his Madison location in November or December. And a popular affair. The Willie Street Fair is this weekend. That'll be two full days of free, funky and folky music and dance and karaoke and magicians. It's also a proper global extravaganza by way of food with West African fare to empanadas to Thai spring rolls and smash burgers. Music starts Saturday afternoon and the parade's on Sunday morning. Check out our show notes for a link if you'd like more deets. And if you go, have fun and be safe. That's all for today here on CityCast Madison. I'm Bianca Martin. If you enjoyed the show, why not share this episode with someone who cherishes a good tea time? We'll be back tomorrow morning with more stories from around the city. Until then, ciao. Trixies. It trick it, trick it, Trixies, Trixies. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hugging.